everybody. Hi. My name is Marianne McClendon. I'm the program coordinator over at Hunger Free Colorado. I have been there for about five years now. Started as an AmeriCorps VISTA, transitioned my way into more of a supervisor position, and uh, thank you all so much for volunteering your time and uh, efforts. Everything that you do is valuable. We really appreciate everything that you do to serve the community. I know that a lot of this information you probably are already going to know. Some of this is just going to re repeat some of that, and then we'll go into the details later on May 17th. I'm Elizabeth Martin, and I am the Care and Chair Snap Analyst, and I provide snap outreach in the Southern Colorado area and training to our Care and Chair partners in that area. Pressing this middle button. So this will be our agenda today. I'm sorry, we're going to go over um, what my role is and what your role is and how we are going to be here to serve you. Uh, we'll go over the technical assistance, the resources that will be available to you, and then also the overview. So we're not going into details today, but we're going to touch on what we will be going over later. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to raise your hand during this presentation. If there's something that comes to mind, if you don't feel comfortable asking right away or you feel like you're interrupting, just write it down. I will answer those questions. Just let me know. <coughs> So these are some of the resources that we do or the, the programs that we offer. First, we have our food resource hotline. We take around 6,500 calls inbound each year. That number is increasing. We've already met all of our goals for the fiscal year. Um, we're already at 100% of everything and uh, exceeding that significantly. We have three more months left of that fiscal year. Our referrals that have come in, not just through Kaiser, uh, Children's Hospital, National Jewish Health, also, some community partners such as Denver Urban Now Matters, and um, we also have St. Joe's Hospital referring to us. That number has increased by at least 20% this year. As soon as we receive a referral, we answer that call immediately. <laughs> we usually we have about 24 hours at max before responding to a client uh, if it happens to run over a weekend. <laughs> We're open Monday through Friday from 8 to 4.30. Our navigators are bilingual, so it's Spanish and English. If someone that you serve happens to not speak Spanish or English, they can always call us with someone who might be able to translate. We can mail them documentation that would be helpful. Or if you're willing to call and stand in a line, that would also be beneficial too. We screen clients for all federal nutrition programs. So, uh, as Ashley was mentioning earlier, if they have a child in the home, we will refer out to the summer food sites, um, the WIC uh, locations, how they can enroll, what, what they'll need to be providing to those, uh, those locations. <coughs> we also have our outreach efforts that we do. We, have, um, um, we used to have a mobile unit, our truck that went around, some of you may be familiar with that, that has no, is no longer going out. We have uh, our out outreach lead, who she goes out and does application systems at sites. <coughs> We have policy and advocacy. Some of you are probably familiar with some of that. Uh, if you can go on our website, you can see what we have accomplished. You remember that 26 long page application with food assistance and the public benefit programs? That was because Kathy Underhill has taken, uh, and our executive director took the initiative and worked on it to reduce it to eight pages. So those are some of the things that we've done, and which has created a significant difference in the world of SNAP, which we will go in and discuss as well. We also have our Colorado Food Pantry Network. This is a great <coughs> way for existing food pantries to, uh, to get involved and work together. Some of them have changed their hours as a result of being involved in this food pantry network. They will uh, discuss what, what types of foods they might provide, or they might change what uh, client processes they have for, at, at their local food pantries. This is a great resource for people to belong to if you want additional knowledge. Oh, and partnerships around there. And this is, oh, this is me. <laughs> okay. 
Um, so just a little bit about Care and Share, um, what we do in our SNAP um, outreach program. We are predominantly outreach. We go into the community and we actually sit one-on-one -on -one with individuals and do applications. Um, since we began doing the application process, we have successfully processed 2,100 applications and touched about 5,000 individual, individuals personally. We also worked with the United Way in doing um, calls. They would refer calls to us, and I worked directly with the Pikes Peak United Way for a while there as well. Um, I now have seven. This says six, but now I have seven. Yay, us. <laughs> we needed it. So we do about 80 to 100 hours of volunteer time per month working in the community um, providing services to our various locations. We have 12 outreach sites um, and we are now working with um, some of the departments of corrections as well, helping them to provide SNAP benefits to transitioning parolees, which is really pretty neat. Um, that's um, done via email and phone, talking with them, helping them to provide assistance through their um, secured services. Um, we have eight, eight trained outreach locations besides the sites that we personally go to that provide assistance to the, in the, within the community also um, that I assist by providing support, which we'll be doing within this grant as well, providing technical assistance to some of the grantees in this grant. Um, our advocacy program is we provide um, 2,400 SNAP um, flyers, which we um, designed in-house with information regarding the SNAP program, the federal program, as well as some of the care and share information that go out in CSFP boxes into the community quarterly, into the backpack programs quarterly <coughs> as well, so that families that receive benefits from care and share um, food boxes and backpacks through the school program also get information on SNAP that may not otherwise receive information or may not be willing to approach someone about that information <coughs> because it's confidential has a phone number they can call the state or they can contact me to find out how to get enrolled in backpacks um, the we also um, <coughs> excuse me have 31 T T T FAP sites um, 33 CSFP sites, is that right? You can't see them? But I can see them. Um, <laughs> yes, I got this information from our per program department. So these are our partner agencies. Um, 33 backpack sites and 22 summer food um, pantries, food mobile sites, mobile pantry sites, is what they call it. Um, 11 after school snack and meal sites. So where did she go? Is there? I think we're part of that, is that right? Maybe? Um, five school pantries, 18 mobile food, food pantries, and 216 emergency um, pantries where we're able to help families in need in the community um, to get information and food out to those in need um, throughout the southern Colorado area. Um, and that's what we do within our community downtown. Um, and this one, I think we both can talk to you. Oh. So this one, is, it are, uh, we will be helping uh, these organizations here, and we will all be helping these organizations yes. over here for the technical assistance. Uh, and I believe this next slide will go over. Yes. Yes. So uh, if you want to touch on what you all will be doing for the technical assistance. Sure. Um, um, as per the grant, um, we will be providing the in-person training no later than May 31st of 2016, and that's to be determined with the grantees as to upon their um, hiring of their personnel that they need. Um, and then we'll have the one-on-one -on -one training as needed, conference calls or in person, whatever works out for them, I'm open to. And then monthly conference calls, again, as needed. I'm open and flexible to serve the needs of those that we're going to be working with. And we will be doing, for the first eight weeks or so, weekly TA phone meetings. If you all have questions, you want Please wait until then. There are, there are a lot of um, different agencies here, and there will be a lot of people who will be doing the applications in the field. Unless it's something that that you really need assistance and it might be more of an emergency, then definitely give me a call, email me. But uh, let's try to talk together about those issues because if you're having an issue, that other organization probably is as well. Uh, 
and then we will we'll move it to a monthly TA conference calls for the remainder of the grant period. We'll be collecting data for you if you would like for us to collect that information um, that is available. Is so, for example, the SNAP train the trainers that we've been doing in the past with agencies that we've gone out to, we ask monthly, uh, how many applications have you completed this month? I then put it in a report on your account that we use in our, in our program, and we'll uh, give you a report each month which you know where you're at. Uh, we also have a script to follow. We have, it, we have documentation and a lot of material that you can use. I will show you an example of what we'll be using on May 17th for your training. Is there any questions with this? Um, so in addition to the conference calls, I mean, if we just have one particular question, maybe we did an application and the client had a question that we didn't have an answer to, do we email you? Can yeah. Email us you would email me. Okay. And I will give you that information. Uh, also, collect that, that information. If you happen to email me before our meetings, if you can, we'll go over that so that everybody else knows what happened uh, prior to that, and then we can discuss it. Any other questions in regards to this? Is everybody familiar with SNAP? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you all are. So this is just a brief overview of what that is. Uh, many people don't understand that that is a federal USDA term. In Colorado, we refer to it as a food assistance program. So the Denver Human Services Office or whichever human services office that you're working in, they refer it as the food assistance program. Many of our clients still refer to it as food stamps. So that's how we still refer to it on the hotline because it is just commonly used and known. Uh, we know that this is a supplemental program. People are still going to need assistance through food pantries. That is not going to go away until they are uh, lifted out of poverty and this program through SNAP does help them through that. And again, intended for certain So what is SNAP, the EBT card? Is, is everyone familiar with what the EBT card looks like? That card is used as like a debit card would be. They no longer have it in a stamp form. We do have uh, some brochures that we can give to you if, you if you need to. It's also, I prefer to probably email it because I don't know that we have a lot of material to, to mail out. But if you need some of that material to hand out to your clients, it does give you the phone number, how to use the card, when they're going to have their allotment deposited onto that card, and uh, how often. So it has all that information on there. If they happen to lose their pen, that information is in that brochure. It's offered in Spanish and English, so we're happy to get that to you. Another question? Yeah. Um, are the ABT cards, do they, is there like a portal that the client can go to, sort of like a bank? Sort of. So there is an option. It is, it's administered through uh, Chase. On the back of the card, there is their, the, the website. They can register their EBT card and then check their balance online just as a bank account. They can also call up to 10 times um, through the number that is listed on the back of that card and check the balance that is left. Whenever they use their, their card at a grocery store or wherever it's allowed, uh, some farmers markets, but not very many in Colorado, they can, on the bottom of the receipt that they get, will tell them the balance left on, that, uh, on their card. So that is very helpful also. Um, it is ministered through the federally, 100%. So if you hear that it is 80%, 20%, that is not true. It is 100% federally funded. It is administered through the state to the counties. So there are 64 counties in Colorado, and Colorado, uh, each of the counties then manages those clients within. This gives you a brief overview of the characteristics of SNAP. As you can see, 74% uh, is it, it has a child in it or someone who is elderly or disabled. So there is a very small percentage of people who are going to be on it for a shorter period of time or working. It kind of puts it in the perspective of the clients and the people that we're serving. We are now ranked 45th. We were 50th. <laughs> so, that's because of all of you. Right. All of you all are helping us bring this number up. And this is through our efforts. It does impact it. It doesn't really seem like 45th is a really great spot, but it is getting better. Um, 733,080 Coloradans are suffering from hardship. 
that significant. It comes out to 57% of eligible Coloradans are participating. So that is up to us to get the word out, to let people know of what is available to them, how can we reduce barriers, what can we say to people to get them out of that situation. So it's just really working together to try to get that number up. Some more statistics for you. Uh, and I do have all these references if you'd like those later, and they will be also provided in this manual, so you'll have all of those to, to reference. From 2008 to 2015, we have the, we, the, the number of people participating in these programs grew significantly, 63%. So you see that that number might be increasing, and yes, our economy is improving, but what's happening, I believe, is that more knowledge and more information is getting out there to the community of, and the perceptions and myths are being dispelled, so it's, I hope that that's the reason. Uh, and 2009 to 2012, it lifted more than 117,000 Coloradans out of poverty. <coughs> Here we can see the positive impacts of what SNAP does. When someone goes to the grocery store, it stimulates the economy. That not only does it stimulate from $5 and generate to $9.20, but it sustains jobs. People keep their jobs. Grocery stores don't go out of business. If more people were spending money at the grocery store, there would be less of that. Uh, more people would be able to pay their bills, their medical bills. There would be it's just a better usage overall. So SNAP does stimulate the economy. We have many documents on this on our website. I would suggest checking those out so that you can Warn yourselves or educate yourselves a little bit more on that. It also helps the food pantries. So if people are receiving SNAP, then less people are going to be utilizing the food pantries or as often. Yes, they're using it as a supplement, but they won't be uh, going as often. So how you can help, uh, you just become more educated around and aware of, of uh, the eligibility rules behind food stamps, who is eligible for it. Uh, and do some outreach yourself. Talk to your clients. Um, put out material. Let them know what they, they could receive. And help them dispel some of those myths. We have documents on uh, questions of Q&A on who is eligible or, or uh, a lot of documents on, for example, someone who is undocumented, if they're eligible for food stamps, and then it, it, how that might impact their um, getting, getting citizenship, which is not true. So those are some, that's some information that would be good to have and pass out to your clients. Uh, and learning about Hunger Free Colorado and our advocacy and what you can do with legislation. We'll go into the application process. So I know this is a lot of information on one slide, but I would like for you all just, just to see the flow of what it is for a client's experience. First, they will go and apply through the PEAK website with us. Uh, then they will be able to check their benefits. So you can you can help them with logging in, showing them how to navigate the system. This will be discussed with the PEAK team also in more detail. We're not going to go into the PEAK's website itself. They will complete their interview within, usually within that first week after completing that application online. They will receive a call. Generally, it's uh, with very quick. And if they don't get that call, it is up to the client to reschedule their appointments. Um, Every county does it a little bit differently. I, I don't know exactly how El Paso County does it, but I do know that in Denver County, the technician will call twice, they will leave a message, uh, and then they will mail them something out letting them know about their interview being missed. So that is uh, their process. Each county will look a little bit differently. They have 10 days to submit their documents after that interview. They should get that information right away. They technically have a little bit longer, but in order for their benefits not to be delayed, their documents should be in rather quickly. They need to attend uh, an employment first training class if they're between the ages of 18 and 49. We will go over that again later, but uh, just to give you an idea, if they miss that, they will be sanctioned and they will need to reschedule that. Their benefits will stop. Then they must go down to the county office and pick up their EBT card. They will be approved for at least that first month. If they don't get those documents in and they don't intend that employment first trading, they will not get benefits that next month. So it's really important that we uh, give that information to the client to let them know what those next steps are. 
I can give you some examples of a letter that we use at Hunger Free Colorado when we do applications over the phone. We let them know what, what they need to do in steps, what their tracking number is, how to log into their account, what documents they will need to provide to the county office because we don't want to see churn. We don't want that client to come back to us and have to go through the application process again. After that, they redeem their benefits. The benefits are usually uploaded by 6 o'clock that day. I believe there are three times the benefits are, down, are uploaded, but we tell them around 6 o'clock, check on the back of that card or go use a card if you're not sure how to uh, call and find out what those balances that balance is. But you can swipe it and you can see if they just buy a pack of gum. Some people aren't really uh, user-friendly with, with this kind of stuff, so it's, it's easier to sometimes to just test it that way. Did you have another question? <laughs> Do you have, for those um, that are doing on-site applications, is that the that, that Yes. Um, so when she does an application, is there any equivalent to this that can be given to the family, like mm -hmm. these are the next steps that you can expect, mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. maybe a blank line where yes. you're like filling your, your tracking numbers? Yes. Like and, okay. Yeah, I can get that information to you. Yeah, and what I'll do is, all this information that I'm talking about, that I'm saying I'm going to give to you, I'll give to Lynette. Uh, or whomever it is that's going to be able to distribute it out to you and then show it, slow it down. Elizabeth, can you explain the practice for El Paso County? Is it any different than this? It, it is a little bit different for El Paso County. Um, so, um, El Paso County, <laughs> once you do your application, you do give them a tracking number. We give them a, a next steps document that includes their tracking number along with contact information who the applicant should contact if they don't hear from El Paso County within 24 to 48 hours. El Paso County likes to do the intake call within seven days, regardless of expedited or not. Um, and they, I train all of our um, outreach locations to actually upload documentation. So you'll be trained how to scan the documents in and upload them into the PEAK application so the applicant doesn't have to worry about getting to DHS and getting documents in because we do it for them. If you don't have the capability of scanning, then I will teach you how to get them faxed or um, copied and sent over to SNAP at Customer Care, which is also El Paso County, um, and that expedites the process as well. So we do it a little bit differently. Yeah. They can also use the phone. Yeah. They, can. they can. We can we deal them. with a different group of people. Well, <laughs> in general, yes, they, that's can. In general, they can use their phone. They can. Yeah, yeah they can. But and in general, our groups that we're dealing with are, are a little bit more indigent population. The majority of the people that we will see, um, so they don't have that general capability. So we've come up with a much more simplified process to make sure that they get their benefits in every time we get But yeah, so we have the form with the application number and everything. Um, everybody will get all that. And, um, you'll get the links to the USDA and where to get all your documents and all that stuff. What happens during the interview? They will basically go over everything that we've entered into the application. They're just going to reconfirm everything. Yeah. And then the more detail right. you put in, it's mm -hmm. garbage in, garbage out. The right. more you put in that's accurate, the better the application is, the quicker mm -hmm. the benefit. Right. And at the county level, um, correct me if I'm wrong, they really don't have access to a lot of languages for their language. It depends on which county, of course. <laughs> Right, and they, the counties have to produce certain Thank languages. You. There are federal regulations and requirements around it. It's like thir if it makes up if a language makes up 13 percent or more of the population, they have to provide it in that language. Yeah. Yeah. So Denver Human Services, for example, they have a language line. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 They have a language line. It's not in person. So right. It's not enough, but no. That's the difference. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, but it does work. I have used it myself. Yeah. So yeah. it takes a little bit longer, but it differs. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. we use Seracom and Children's mm -hmm. Services. But as a family navigator, I turn the refugees to public benefits, mm -hmm. and when we call the county, we it is that that makes it more challenging. But again, mm -hmm. they have to be able to translate for them, one way or another. Which is, it it would be better if they have an advocate for someone to 
to complete a client authorization form that can speak to the county on their behalf. Any other questions before we move on? So these are some do's and don'ts. Don't tell them what their benefit amount is going to be. Don't try to, to figure that out. <laughs> Because that, that sets the, everybody up for failure. Um, it can make you liable, it can disappoint the client, and the county doesn't really like it either. So we'll try to stay away from doing that. Things that you should say, it looks like you may be eligible. So when you go and you look, you're looking at the, the income chart, it's never, never a good idea to tell people not to apply, even if it's somewhere right on the line. It's not, we're not eligibility technicians, we're just helping. We are literally volunteers helping them through the process. It, this is the county to determine, not us. There is a, a calculator going around that I've noticed going around. You can use that if you happen to have it, but I would not advise showing the, the client that information. So there is a redetermination process. Three months means, an able, excuse me, able-bodied means someone who is able to work, someone who can, between the ages of 18 and 49, who is able to work. There is the Employment Workforce Program, and that is to the age of 59. Um, but there is a new, not a new rule or a new law, but people who are between these ages must be working within three months. Uh, if they are not, then they will be kicked off the program, and they cannot reapply. So that, it, that will be a, a rule that they must follow. But usually they will be having to do that Employment First Work Program, so it doesn't really affect them as much as anything. Can I just build on that? Yes. Because I just actually um, shared that information. Um, it went into effect on April 1st of 2016. Um, Colorado did adopt this law. And it is if you are um, an able-bodied working adult, you must either be gainfully employed or do volunteer time that is acceptable um, volunteer time um, or be enrolled in a school program that is going to be deemed acceptable as well for a school program or you will only get your benefits for three months every three years. Right. So what that means for those individuals that are out in the community that are taking advantage of the system, which there's not many, I'll tell you that, the majority of the people on the program are in some capacity in need of the program. They will lose their benefits if they don't adhere to what the state standards are, which are the state standards. They will lose their benefits and they will not get them back for three years. Okay. That went into effect April 1. That's why becoming uh, knowledgeable about all of these rules uh, as providers uh, in the community is really important and valuable to share that information with the clients. Um, so the redeterminations are based on that. Three months if you're able-bodied, you will get a redetermination. You can do this by paper, you can do it through PEAK, um, you can do this in person, but we do this over the hotline also. So we do the, the not just the application, but we can do change reports, mm -hmm. we can do redeterminations, and then take the same process with the client. And then there is six months. For the, this is for the majority of the clients that are on the program. This is usually if you have a family and you're, you're not an elderly or disabled. If you're elderly or disabled, it moves to 12 to 24 months. It goes to 24 months when not a whole lot changes in the, in the household. For example, if you have a, a someone who is disabled and they don't have a job, then they will be at 24 months. If they are disabled and they have a job, a part-time job, then they will do it every 12 months because they have some changes happening now. Do you have any questions about this? <coughs> there are also change reports that go out. If people don't complete these forms, whether they have changes or not, their benefits will stop, and then they'll have to reapply. So when people get this, these documents in the mail, and change reports are, you know, every six months maybe, it's random. So they, they get the, this information, and the blank forms in the mail must be completed, turned in. There is a box on that change report form that says no changes, but they have to sign it and send it in. This is the income chart, which you will also be getting, but you can see here that, for example, one a household of one can make $12.76 a month. This is gross income, and what this means is 
before taxes. The 981 does not mean anything after taxes. That's after certain expenses are considered. So it will go at 130% of the federal poverty line. The, the, uh, they, the USDA determined that the federal poverty line is somewhere around 11,800, I believe, for a household of one. So anything over that, up to 130%, which is closer to about $15,000 for a household of one, that's how they determine these numbers. It will go further. ECE means they are categorically eligible. This means here that this is someone who is on another program would be categorically eligible to receive this. So someone who is uh, receiving Social Security, for example, is categorically eligible to receive food stamps. But then again, it goes based on their expenses. They would have to have a lot of medical expenses if they're closer to that maximum amount here uh, in order to get uh, any, any benefits. So the benefit amount for one person can range from $16 to $194. You hear a lot of seniors saying, well, I only get $16. Well, that is because they don't have enough in medical expenses or they might live in subsidized housing. The, there are two columns here. You see two eligibility category for eligible uh, columns. One the is at 165%, and this is if they, are, they have uh, two people in the home and they are applying separately. So they have two seniors in the home and they're applying separately. If you have a roommate who happens to be a senior, but you share food together, even if you do, you can have separate, uh, if you have different diets and so on. Uh, then there is 200%. So this is for seniors and disabled only, that they can get 200% of the federal poverty line. It's a little bit higher helps them a little bit more be eligible to receive food stamps. And that again is only considering because they have medical expenses. So on residency, you have to be a United States citizen. Although people who are undocumented can have their children apply if they are born in the United States. <coughs> Legal permanent residents. They have to be legal permanent residents for five years in order to receive benefits. And then what makes up a household? It's anyone preparing, buying, or, sh or sharing food together. So it can be the pizza guy. <laughs> and he lives in your basement. You lives in your basement. <laughs> and it can be you. So it does not have to be a family member in order to be on a household. Just ask the right questions. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> No. Do you mean like people who are maybe in high five. school? Anybody. As soon as you're born, you can be on the subcase. Do you mean like if the parent is undocumented and they have children? So the parent is the head of household, but the children are eligible. Right. So the parent is applying, not eligible, but the children are eligible. So you list the children under the parent. Mm -hmm. Children get benefits, mom and dad do not. Right. Question, what age there isn't children? an age. If they're born here, they're If they're born here, yeah, but it's for if they're not, it's five, five years. years. Mm -hmm. For children, they don't have to wait the five years. That's for Medicaid. Okay, for so it's stamps. different. Okay. Mm -hmm. Separate. Okay. That, that's going to be one of the confusing <laughs> parts about these programs. Colorado, separate. Yes. So uh, if a child can get with, they can get with. I'm okay. <laughs> Sorry. Need a chill. Yes. Well, are your questions relative to this slide? Because if they are, we can interject right. them now. Yeah. We do have time because technically we were starting at 2.30. <laughs> so, so, so I guess if like a child where, I mean, I assume if they have a work permit, like if they're under a DACA? Nope. That would not count. So they have to be born here yes. or have or they could be a refugee, an asylee, yes. asylum, correct. Um, sex, what's the other one? Sex, sex, sex trade. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of there's a lot of information out there. That this will all come. I mean, yeah. it is not yeah. cut and dry. Right. This is why we're doing the, the yes. TA also. SNAP is an ongoing learning process because it's never every application is different and right and everyone has a little caveat in it that you go oh and then you learn as you go it's going to be the and you'll be asking the questions 
all the time. Well, I have this person in front of me. How do I do? What do I do with this? Or how do I do this? And that's it's a constant learn. Right. It is. I, I'm still learning. It's a constant learn. And then about the household, so how are there pretty clear determinations for like who lives in the household and if you share anything? I mean, there are lots of there's a yeah. link in Peak you can click. If it, yeah. like if you're in doing the application and you're not sure who to add, click here. Click and yeah. it'll tell you. And we'll we'll how go over works. that in yeah. the Peak presentation. Yeah. Okay. The Peak presentation yeah. will help with it how to nice how to I document yeah. the thing. It helps yeah. you. Yeah. And something I I I do also. I'm not sure if it's just too complicated. I'm going to do that application regardless. Right. Yeah. Uh, yes. Absolutely. Right. And, and, and it's up to them. Right. Ask the extra questions. So I, I'm not going to make the determination. <coughs> and I'm not going to tell someone no. You can't so, tell them no. Right. But that would be a thing that let's say if a, if a family was applying and they they weren't sure or we weren't sure if their sister with multiple children living in the basement that didn't share expenses, but sometimes they can be together. separate. Right, so, but anyway, if we, did, if we went ahead and did that application, that would be something that the county would ask to verify yes. during the interview. Exactly. Okay. So, I'm just going to say one thing, because this is really important, and it is actually a federal law. You cannot tell someone they cannot apply. If they say to you, I want to apply for SNAP, you do the application. You cannot, let, you cannot say you cannot apply. I could have said, I'm applying for SNAP. You have to take my application. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Okay. Okay. There was no question. <laughs> 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 okay. Important. So this, there are certain options here. Um, they can do this through Peak at your locations. They can call us. Um, that we can do set up the referrals. Some of you are through doctors' care, I believe. You all are sending us referrals, I think. Maybe not. Mm -hmm. uh, I know Children's yeah. Hospital is. <laughs> Got that one right. <laughs> or we can set up application assistance sites. NIMPA can come to you. And NIMPA Drago is our application assistance lead. And she does the applications there. Um, she will set up those arrangements and we'll be able to figure that out with you. Uh, and then there's a single purpose application. That is a paper application. They, they can do that also. If someone isn't comfortable with you taking their social security number, you can say, well, here you go. And this is how you do it. Um, they can go down to the local county office. They can mail in that paper application. They can fax it. They can do it however is easiest for them. And Karen Share has several locations for their application assistance sites also. So I believe that that number Will you provide that to? It's actually our it's it's our Karen Chair office number, and then um, my cell phone number is also on the card. Um, so for our, anyone that's working within our Southern Colorado area, they'll have access to me. Me. <laughs> we have plenty of resources for you. Thanks to Kaiser, we were able to redo our awesome SNAP training manual and have it translated to Spanish. So this is what everyone receiving the training will receive. This goes into more detail, and we will go over all of this information. I know you can't see it, so, but Ooh, there it is. Yes. To, to assist with the applicants, the applications, do we need to the, get approval from the county office to do that? No. Is there like any change? No. no. So, we only needed the counties or the state's approval, USDA approval, to be able to do applications over the phone. We needed to be able to do that because of the, uh, the telephonic signature. If you're doing it in person, you're just helping them do it. May, they see those, those uh, rules and regulations, which you really should be reading to them and letting them know what that information is. So that is something that's really valuable. If you can print them out and hand it to them, yes. that would be even better. But that is why... Uh, you don't need to have that permission to do this, to do that, because they're right there. Mm -hmm. Sign. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other questions with this? You can also get um, hotline cards from us. Just let me know, and I'll mail them out to your sites. There is free USDA material also. There, they have these great folders, and they have the verifications on the front. When you're do when you're working with people. They can just say, you can check off what you think they need, and they, the county may, of course, ask for more, 
but you can at least get them started and then they can fill that packet with that information. Uh, this is free. So I really go to this website. I brought a whole bunch. Oh, yeah, we, we have one for each Perfect. one of the grantees. Thank you, That's Karen. That's exactly what I was yep. talking about. These are great resources. Yep. And they offer them in Spanish and English yep. also. Uh, this is also the cal a, a calculator, one of the ones that I was referring to before. You're welcome to use that to just get you a, give you an idea. Do you know what grade level all the paperwork that the client's looking over is at? Supposedly it's fifth grade. Yeah. Okay. We do a room, so it's good to know. Yeah, it's still difficult. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just a good framework. Okay. Any other questions? All right, well, again, your work here is valuable. So please, if you ever have any questions, let us know. We'll get through this. <laughs> um, your clients probably are going to really, really benefit from this. Um, this is going to be impact your communities greatly. So thank you so much for all of your efforts.